I thought at noon, uh, in addition to the fact that you need to enjoy your lunch, that uh, I will not uh, do death by PowerPoint. <laughs> in fact, what I'd like to do, even though we're set up in a lecture environment, I'd like to have a conversation about climate, climate models, um, things that we really know well, things that we sort of know and then things we don't know. I also want to apologize for not uh, being with you more. We actually have three international meetings uh, going. This is an international meeting. It's from Germany. So it's an international meeting. <laughs> uh, but we also have the uh, atmospheric uh, electrification meeting, which you might think of as a big lightning meeting. And in Oklahoma City, uh, our civil engineering department uh, at OU is hosting uh, the first meeting in Oklahoma City of the American Society for Mining and Reclamation. I spoke there yesterday about the reclamation challenge of the future, and that is how do you reclaim carbon dioxide that is emitted from power plants? That is a big time reclamation problem. But anyway, I'd just like to get us going, and, and I'd like to tie in the other uh, meeting, that namely the electrification, abstract electrification electrification meeting, the lightning meeting. And as I was driving down to uh, open that meeting, I started thinking about the biogeochemistry of the planet and how remarkable it is. I mean, it's really, it's remarkable. And, and that, uh, the aspect of the planet that I'm most studying uh, it's actually referred to in the Bible, you have the phrase, dust to dust. If you uh, think about formation of life and uh, what it does, is it takes uh, dead life, essentially goes from very simple molecular compounds up to very big organic compounds, and then back to very simple compounds. Now, Way CO2 enters in this is that you've uh, built up big complex carbon molecules, uh, all hydrogen and oxygen, things stop or made up. And then uh, when it oxidizes, then that breaks down. Essentially, it's like a fire, oxidation. And then you think to yourself, well, you know, how does this carbon cycle work? in case you were in an oxygen limited environment. How does this dust to dust work there? And that's where there is this kind of back door. And that is you have these complex carbon molecules and the breakdown is byproduct is methane, CH4, no O around. So in some sense the back door for life get this dust to dust going is this ability to have a breakdown that is not, not an oxidation. So then you think, well, okay, now you start to pile up all this method. How do I how do I get out of that loop? And that is through ozone. It just gets the oxygen the oxidizing power of the atmosphere. So whereas uh, you may have oxygen poor environments, marshes, tundra, and so forth, or wet areas very oxygen poor, once you get something into the atmosphere, then the atmosphere is able to oxidize. Well, what if, what, where does the ozone come from? What, what sustains the oxidizing capacity of that? Well, why did that run down? And of course, that's where lightning comes in. So, lightning is primary ways for ozone. So, you, you could ask yourself how would the planet work if there were no lightning? It's a really interesting question. 
first of all, it would probably if we'd all have static electricity around, I mean we'd all be terribly upset. <laughs> but it is an interesting question. Now, how central is lightning actually the keeping a planet that has life on it? See, life is one of the very unusual things. It is, it's one of the few things that kind of runs against entropy. You kind of run, you run up some street in that city. And of course, that's where all of this uh, climate issue comes into play. Is that, uh, one of the things that we've done in our ability to sustain ourselves as a species is we've learned that a lot better to use fossil fuels than human labor and animals. The change, and of course, we're all working on the Industrial Revolution. That's, that's what uh, you see the beginnings. If you look at the ice core data, you can see right around 1770. Uh, you see the CO2 and the kick up. And that would be just the Industrial Revolution. And, Frankly, the, you could say that uh, burning the fossil fuels is not a bad thing. In fact, it's really, it has it, been very tough to hold this meeting without the consumption of some fossil fuels. So it, it just has this unusual byproduct of um, the fact that CO2 is greenhouse gas. And there's nothing wrong with greenhouse gas. I mean, the greenhouse gas is absolutely necessary for life on the planet. It would be a very cold place. So I think one of the things we want to think about is what, given the fact we know absolutely for sure that CO2 and methane are greenhouse gases, and we know absolutely for sure they're increasing the atmosphere, and most of the increased, 90% of the most of that increase is due to either the burning of fossil fuels or the production of fossil fuels. And that, um, we also have to go through that the burning fossil fuels is at the center of the most industrialized economies on the planet. Every industrialized economy on the planet consumes fossil fuels. Right now, the consumption is pretty fast, too, because we've come out of the recession, in which case, during the recession, we actually saw a decrease in the consumption or in the emissions for most of the countries in China. China didn't even see the recession. But as a planet, we're uh, over the last few years uh, coming out of the recession. 2010-14, increase annually increase in the uh, emissions of CO2 from fossil fuels about six percent a year. Higher percent we get on the main savings accounts, so six percent a year. That's a clip of the law. So we also know that see, first of June, uh, the Mount Loa data showed that uh, CO2 was 401 parts per million. Pre-industrial value was 286. About 43% in CO2 the world. About 43% of all the So, the question is how, how well do we understand this problem? Where, where are the real big questions I'd like to chat about this? We've got people in the audience here that know an awful lot more about this than I do. Keith, John, and Tony knows a lot. Derek, also. Everyone I think knows that. Talk is Carlos. So, I started thinking about it. I think. Four areas that I would think in terms of the scientific part of the physical climate system. I think we still do not understand well what is going to be the cloud water. Let's talk about that. It's easy in some sense. You warm up the planet. And first of all, yeah, that's not so you warm up. And it makes sense. I mean, if you if you increase the greenhouse gas is rather substantial, it'd be unusual not to warm up the planet. I mean, that, you know, that would just be an unusual thing. So if you warm up the planet, uh, you're going to in increase temperature. So that means you're going to have more water in the atmosphere. Now, now that also means if you increase evaporation, I mean, what goes up kind of comes down. So if you increase evaporation, you're going to have to increase percentage. Otherwise, the atmosphere just fill up with water. I mean, you all fish. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> at some point, you know, it's got to come down. So more evaporation, more rainfall. 
that way. And that counts really where the main faults would be. You could assume, maybe, I think, I think this is a tough one, tougher, that wet areas might get wetter and dry areas might get dry. I, that, I know that that's being said. I, I still think that isn't to me that that doesn't seem to be first order of truth. You might shift things around. Change the gradient between the poles and low latitudes in terms of temperature. That would move things around. So I think the, the question then is uh, if you put more water vapor in the, in the atmosphere, will you make more clouds? You have the potential to make clouds. And then the question would be where are those clouds going to sit in the atmosphere? Are they going to Light cloud clouds or dark clouds. Then that goes in the albedo. The reflectivity of the cloud. I mean, you could argue that some have. I mean, that there are, there's one abstract scientist who, I guess, in the popular literature, he's called a denier uh, at MIT, who uh, believes that if you increase the albedo, therefore, got rid of the problem. That's a simplistic. I, I, I over generalize that thing. You could argue that you would increase the LP of the planet that cooled the planet. Because then you can have to allow what happens to the cooled planet, get the water out of the atmosphere, and you have this thing to balance out. Because you're still going to be putting CO2 in the atmosphere. At what stage does that break down? So, one of the areas that you might be thinking about hard is uh, try to get at that problem. Clouds and putting more water vapor in the atmosphere and what are the consequences. So I think that's a big problem. The other is uh, the stranger, and that is um, you evaporate more water, you're going to rain more water. What does that say about drought? What does that say anything? If, if it turns out you do rain more in wet areas, then you could argue that dry areas are dry. And if you really think about the great question facing the planet, drought <coughs> is probably one of the big things. In fact, there are people in the United States Department of Defense that think the issue of drought, and particularly drought in areas, I'll use the old language, the third or fourth world, in areas without a lot of infrastructure, in areas of poverty, in areas that are already hot. Increasing drought could lead to political instabilities. Some people say that uh, the instabilities in Syria can be traced to drought in the agricultural regions. The people lost their farms, moved to cities, they're angry, they're poor, and they're angry. They decide to make an island so bad because they lost their farms and drop. So that's the big issue. I think so. Drought, cloud water feedback. Um, another that I think is a very big issue is uh, ice dynamics. It was interesting, I guess about six years ago, Keith, I was at GFDL and I was talking with, with just a group of us talking, and they were saying, we don't really have a good cryosphere model. We don't have a real good ice model. And they said, you know, one of the reasons we don't have a good ice model is a lot of the dynamicists, people who were interested in dynamical things, were interested in dynamical things. So it'd be like a, having a race car driver interested in a Volkswagen. I mean, a, a race car driver could be either interested in something that drives things. Um, dynamicists would be interested in things that change. Wait, how the atmosphere circulates, how the oceans move, ice is not changing. So, so now we know ice is changing, and in fact, the, the IPCC fifth assessment, I think the phrase that is used, the Arctic sea ice loss since about 1977 or thereabouts, is very likely uh, due to 
So that means at the 90% level. Now, I think that it could be, they said, like, I think it's very likely, but likely would say two out of three, very likely, not out of ten. But I still think it's a complicated issue because it involves more than just melting. In fact, it's a lot more than that. There's some kind of weather patterns that are blowing <coughs> ice up also out into the north. Of Harder problem would be Antarctica. That's an even bigger problem. Now, that's been in the news recently, and I keep it out chatting about this. Some papers out that are showing that because we've actually had some intrusion of the <coughs> southern oceans into an area of grounded ice, that that is eventually going to lead to a, a big chunk of Antarctica coming off. A big chunk of ice. I still think that. I think that still needs to be looked at very carefully. But it is a very complicated, and some of the areas in Antarctica are increasing ice cover, and other areas are losing ice. It's big regions, surrounded by an ocean. Very different problem than, uh, than we see in the Arctic sea ice. So clouds, uh, Arctic sea ice, uh, drought, those would be three or four three of the areas that I would think it would really be important on the physical climate system. And there are others that we're talking about. So I'll touch of that in the preceding talk uh, when we talk about sea surface temperatures, increasing sea surface temperatures. Can you make a causal link now to changes in hurricanes? Do that yet? Uh, the news is, is filled with the fact that yesterday we had in Nebraska, we had two tornadoes. That's very unusual. Normally, you would have cancellation, you would have some interaction. You certainly have seen all the pictures of tornadoes that have those small tornadoes associated with that big one. But to actually see two big ones uh, running side by side about a mile apart. In fact, one little town must be thanking its lucky stars. One went north of it, one went south of it, and the little town was right there between these two. Towns. That must have been a thrilling experience. But, People say, well, this is the new, this is the new reality, this is the way. I don't think it's the way. We, we really don't know how uh, tornadic activity might change because of climate change. You can certainly argue that it will, that there is a high probability that something will happen. But is it going to be more or less? Is it going to shift the distribution? Uh, tornadic activity is very hard anyway. It's, it's, uh, it's a little bit like trying to predict terrorist activity. It's a very highly mobilized time and space event. Whereas a hurricane, I think of as more like the British arm in the 18th century, because it's marching across the field. I might go that way, might go well. Now, Superstorm Sandy is very clever, very sharp. But, but that, that's, a, that's a more strict <coughs> big time prediction problem in terms of more hurricane activity, landfall changes. I think the tornadic one is tough. But both of them are really hard. And it's interesting because you're out in extreme events, and by definition, if you're looking for changes in extreme events, that is going to be extremely difficult. It's out our own size of probability. And we're not even sure what the distribution function looks like. So that's a big problem. But so if, if I were kind of thinking about tax on this, and then we want a conversation, those would be four of the things sea ice, extreme events, uh, drought. Changes in clouds. Other two that I'd like to mention in one final talk, and then we'll talk about them. And that is uh, the biogeochemistry itself. Uh, right now, we know that uh, about half the CO2 that's emitted in fossil fuel burning stays in the atmosphere, about a quarter of it goes into the ocean, and about a quarter of it goes net into the biosphere. Which means the terrestrial biosphere is getting bigger year by year, even after managed. So net, there's a net flux of carbon to the terrestrial biosphere, net, which means it's got to get it's getting bigger. Why is that happening? Now that's a pretty important question because if if 25% of the sink something that we don't know why it's happening, then it's going to be hard to say how it might change in the future because we can't say what's happening right now or why it's happening right now. Is it CO2 fertilization, mainly uh, 
you make plants for water fishing. It's a uh, land use change, uh, regrowing a forest in a big deep forest. Is it things on the margins so that grasslands become grassland shrublands, become forests? Is it that? Is it all those things? Is it lots of little things? Will it continue to happen if we warm the planet? Will it continue to happen if we dry out parts of the planet? I can't tell you what's happening now. But we know what's happening. I mean, we have very, very, very good evidence that's happening. One of the ways that's done is, is, is one of the ways is uh, actually due to Ralph Keeley. David Keeley is the one who started measuring CO2. You know that, that Maloa, his son, actually measured a change in oxidation of uh, uh, the oxygen concentration of the atmosphere. Because when you burn fossil fuel, you're burning fossil carbon. So if you burn fossil carbon, you're going to increase the oxygen in the atmosphere ever so slightly. And so he was able to see, uh, kind of predict, where you are in this carbon-oxygen space that is increasing CO2 and decreasing oxygen. And the two seats don't respond the same way in that carbon space. If you stuff CO2 in the ocean, which is about where the quarter of it's going, that doesn't change the oxygen. So that just moves you down in CO2. That takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. If you put CO2 net into the terrestrial biosphere, that takes CO2 down and puts oxygen on. So using that, you're able to parse out how much is going in the ocean, how much is going into the atmosphere. So, so a big biogeochemical question is on CO2, why is it going into the atmosphere? Second big question is, uh, as you warm high latitudes, what's going to happen with respect to methane? Start warming up large carbon stores that have been active, uh, out of the active cycle. What happens? That's a hard problem. If, it, if it's very wet, as we talked about earlier, it probably come out as methane, but if you dry out the area at the same time you're warming it, then it may come out as CO2. Big difference. I haven't seen anyone who has a definitive model as to how that's going to happen. So those would be two of the biogeochemical. Now, there's another area that I think we'll chat about that it be the legal ramifications on change. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, <coughs> farmers insurance, big insurance company, you've probably seen ads on TV, farmers insurance, big insurance company, is suing the city of Chicago because they're saying the city of Chicago should have known that there is going to be increased precipitation due to global warming. And therefore, the infrastructure of Chicago should not have been overwhelmed by all these rains because farmers' insurance held a lot of money. And so, farmers' insurance is saying, because of climate change, you should have known, you should have taken action, and uh, we're going to sue you, city of Chicago. That's interesting. That's an interesting thing. You can imagine, I mean, uh, where, where does that play out? And who decides? Imagine that in a courtroom. That'll be interesting. But what are the legal ramifications? Three insurance companies. Could you argue that, well, the game has changed? And uh, I mean, we have, this is an issue in, you've seen it. I mean, if, if, is, if it is an act of God, then you bite off the insurance company, gets off. Awesome. Well, is this an act of God or not? Which, which one is? Is it climate variability? Or is it antibiotic climate change? It's a really interesting question. Um, how do you evaluate risk? What, what will be the societal mechanisms for treating a change in risk? The way we've done this in the past is, uh, I kind of likened it to, I mean, we look at historical records. And insurance companies really bet a lot of money off the historical record. What if that's non-stationary? That is, what if that record is being changed? So you can drive across parts of Oklahoma by just looking in the rearview mirror. Road free straight. Look in the rearview mirror and you can stay on road. You cannot drive through uh, southeastern Oklahoma that way. You're getting into the Ozarks and it would be very dangerous to try to drive through southeastern Oklahoma. Even though parts of Oklahoma you can drive by looking in the rearview mirror. So the question would be, when can I look in the rearview mirror? 
how do I evaluate that risk? Where's the, I mean, this is what you want to look at the back of the book, how to the answers, and then you cut it up. So how does society handle risk? How do we handle the legal questions? If my house gets uh, flooded out because of storm surge on top of sea level rise, can I sue the fossil fuel industry? Sea level rise is <coughs> warming, and that's primarily due to CO2 and methane, and that's primarily a product of the fossil fuel industry. Can I sue them? Did you see recently that uh, that in the state of Oregon, uh, two young persons have actually been suing uh, the state for not adequately protecting themselves because the state is not regulating well. In fact, CO2 is continuing to increase the atmosphere. So the state is not doing its responsibility in terms of protecting this common good from the atmosphere. It's really interesting. Because CO2 does, greenhouse gases do fall under the Clean Air Act, so that's perfect. So all of these things I think are really ripe for new thinking and like yourself to say, you know, that's really a decent problem. I think I'm going to go after So I'd be interested in what you're thinking and how, how this week or how this process here is going.